Hi everyone, I'm Steve Plates and welcome to another edition of uh, Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know, Nonprofit Spotlight is the production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at Community Television. And every edition we uh, highlight a nonprofit doing wonderful, wonderful work in Santa Cruz County. And uh, this edition we're really happy to have with us uh, Compassion and Choices and Alina Hammer, who is an Action Network team leader for Compassion and Choices. So welcome, Alina. Thank you so much, Steve. And thank you for having us and for giving me voice today for this important issue. And as I was saying, we were talking a little bit earlier before we started uh, taping, and, and uh, it's an issue in an area that which I am uh, very interested, but unfortunately don't know as much as I would like to. So I'm really looking forward uh, during the course of the program to learning uh, much more about uh, compassion choices and uh, dignity in all stages of life, and of course all the great work that you're doing. So Alina, for people who don't uh, don't know you. Uh, and I know you've done uh, a lot of activist work uh, uh, around Santa Cruz for many, many years, but for people who don't know you, uh, tell uh, our viewers a little bit about yourself and then how you came to, uh, to do your work with Compassion and Choices. I'll be happy to. So I first came to Santa Cruz in 1978, and I like to say that that makes me a local. <laughs> I am a retired bus driver, Metro bus driver. I know that you use the bus system, Steve, so close to you and go Metro. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Uh, I've been a long time labor. I really actually come out of the labor movement and all the skills that I use now to do the work that I do, I learned in the labor movement. So I've done years and years of labor activism, LGBTQ plus activism and women's rights activism. I currently active, uh, advocate for patient-centered care and medical aid in dying. I've been involved with the Death with Dignity movement for more than 40 years, and I currently lead the Compassion and Choices Santa Cruz Action Team, and I also help facilitate death cafes for Santa Cruz Hospice. People always ask me how I got involved in this work. Mm -hmm. In the early 80s, HIV and AIDS came to our community. And there was suffering like we had never seen before or since. And I actually think that you actually, you really had to be there to understand the kind of suffering that I'm talking about. We used to say it was like a nightmare that you couldn't wake up from. And there was so much suffering that people were asking for help to die peacefully. But back then there was no legal way to help somebody end their life peacefully. And that's when medical aid and dying first came on my radar. I've been doing this work uh, since then for more than 40 years mm. and all the work that I do, every trek I took to Sacramento to help get the law passed, all the presentations, every interview, including today, including this one, I do an honor and memory of all the people who suffered so horribly during the AIDS epidemic. Well, it's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. You know, it's interesting, Alina, uh, when I came back to Santa Cruz, having been over the hill uh, working for a, a long period of time, the first uh, volunteer opportunity that I uh, engaged in was with the Santa Cruz AIDS Project. And although I came kind of late to that uh, horrific uh, era in uh, in patient care. Uh, I was able to work with them and do, do some uh, development work with them and help them out. Uh, and I found it very, very gratifying because the need uh, was really so great. So we share that. And I'm glad that you mentioned the uh, St. Cruz AIDS Project and, and the AIDS epidemic and how important that is as a historical you know, uh, touchstone in, in our community and in the nation. Now, Alina, you're working with the uh, Compassion and Choices, of course, uh, uh, part of which is, is, is end of life care and you know ensuring dignity uh, for folks at every stage of their life. But right. tell us a little bit about uh, the history of, of the current the legislation and uh, where we are in terms of people uh, being able to, uh, to access medically uh, assisted uh, uh, end of life. 
Before I do that, I want to say that I was at the uh, Santa Cruz AIDS Project before they opened in 1985. I'll be done. So our paths may have actually crossed there. See, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. So who is Compassion and Choices? It is the nation's largest, oldest, and most active nonprofit working to improve care, expand options, and empower everyone to chart their own end of life journey. How we live the final chapter of our lives and how we die are amongst the most deeply personal considerations of our lives. And while it's our right to decide how much or how little treatment we want in our final days, our current healthcare system often ignores our wishes. Too often, patients don't have complete information about the benefits and burdens of treatment options, preventing them from making fully informed decisions about their own care. For more than 40 years, by using a comprehensive strategy, including legislative advocacy, grassroots organizing, media outreach, and litigation, Compassion and Choices, their affiliates and predecessor organizations have led most of the significant advances in the movement to expand and improve end of life care and options. Compassion and Choices is a wonderful organization and I'm so proud to be part of their team. I never thought medical aid and dying would be legal in my lifetime. But now thanks to Compassion and Choices, medical aid and dying is legal in 10 states and Washington DC and we're on the ground in several other states. I believe that this is a civil rights issue of our generation whose time has come. We have a one size fits all healthcare system, which allows too much needless pain and suffering. Compassionate Choices is working for a patient driven system that respects everybody's right to make their own end of life care decisions in consultation with doctors and loved ones, of course. We advocate for expanded options to ensure everyone can die peacefully and with dignity. And their website and phone number will be on the screen during our entire conversation. So if you hear my voice, take note and make note of these um, and their, of their data so you can contact them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lena, and I agree uh, wholeheartedly with uh, with everything that you have said. Uh, and also, we want to remind our viewers that uh, we will be running information about uh, the website address. And and uh, I looked at the website myself in preparation for this program. It's a wonderful website. It's comprehensive. It's it's got so much information about this 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 really crucial, I think, aspect of of our life journey. I think, and uh, to be able to provide dignity for folks, as I was saying, at all stages of their life is important. I was a little surprised uh, the California being the progressive state that it is uh, was not really a, a leader in the, in the end of life uh, palliative care and medically uh, assisted end of life uh, procedures. Uh, you were saying that uh, that there was legislation over passed in 2016, which was just recently uh, updated in updated. 2020. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, so let's talk about what is medical aid in dying. Please. You're going to hear uh, me talk, use these phrases, death with dignity, medical aid in dying, and end of life option act. So what are those things and what's the differences? Death with dignity is the name of the law in Oregon and Washington that provides medical aid in dying for those states. Mm -hmm. The End of Life Option Act is the name of the law in California that provides medical aid in dying for California. So those three terms are interchangeable. If you hear me use any of them, I am talking about medical aid in dying. Very good. So what is it already? What is, what it? is it already? <laughs> it's a medical practice that allows mentally competent, terminally ill adults to request a prescription for medication from their physician, which the person may ingest to die peacefully in their sleep if and when they choose. That's what medical aid and dying is. Mm -hmm. So how do you qualify for medical aid and dying? Please, yeah. That is the question. 
The individual must be a resident of California. They must be 18 years of age or older. They must have a terminal illness with a prognosis of six months or less to live. The person must be mentally competent to make medical decisions and physically competent to self-administer the medication themselves. A person other than the patient can prepare the medication so long as they do not assist the person in ingesting. For example, uh, the medication comes in a powder so they can take the powder, put it in the water and make the slurry for you. Mm -hmm. or they can hold the cup while you drink it, but the individual must drink it with the use of a straw if they have a feeding tube, they can plunge it into the feeding tube, but they have to plunge it into the feeding tube, or they can use a rectal catheter. But in all instances, the patient must be able to self-administer the medication themselves. It's actually what differentiates it from euthanasia, mm -hmm. which is something that we do for our animals, but not for each other. Right. Yeah. So that is how you qualify for the law. Now your uh, compassion and choices that uh, you provide uh, uh, a conduit for uh, people who are seeking uh, end of life uh, uh, options to, to physicians and that kind of thing. And so they'll be able to kind of connect with the people who need to kind of weigh in on this. So good question. So we, we help people, but we do not keep a list of doctors who do this. We keep a list of healthcare systems that do it. So you call the 800 number, they're gonna tell you what healthcare system, and then you have to go into that system and find the doctor. And the reason for that is that this law is designed to encourage and normalize the conversation between uh, your doctor and your patient about death. We're all going to face our mortality someday, and we're trying to normalize this conversation between the doctor and the patient. If we had like two doctors, you know, uh, that did all of them, it'd be like abortion clinics or something like that. And so we're trying to normalize the conversation between the doctor and the patient. And that's why there's not a list of doctors, but there is a list of healthcare facilities. And then somebody like myself or some volunteer could help the person go through the process because I'm going to go over that um, in a minute how how um, how you use the law mm -hmm. but you know you have to make verbal requests and written requests and we'll help people do that yeah, I think it's a very good uh, point, a very good policy, is that we want to really broaden the conversation. You want to normalize the conversation it is a stage of life, you know, as is, you know, birth and existence. And, and so the more conversations we have with uh, medically qualified personnel and that kind of thing, uh, certainly uh, fosters more understanding and fosters more um, reaction. Uh, it fosters more comfort level with that. You know, and we all we want to be more comfortable as we move through the various stages uh, of our life. I wanted to ask, uh, without getting too far off the topic, uh, we've all been affected and impacted by the COVID pandemic for the last couple of years, and it really is, um, you know, affected really all aspects of our life. How, uh, if if it all has affected uh, your work, the passion and choices? Well, so. Um... <clears throat> We have come up with an addendum to add to your uh, advanced healthcare directive in case you get COVID where you can um, put down your choices, your end of life choices specifically for COVID. But this was in the beginning when there was a 15 day waiting period, but the new law has given us a 48 hour waiting oh. period. So for a 15 day waiting period, most people did not live 15 days once they got COVID. So this, this law didn't help them, but we did come up with the addendum to help them have uh, the options they wanted at the end of their life if they got COVID. 
And I know you've been an activist uh, for many years, and so you're sensitive to uh, uh, underserved communities, uh, right. of which we certainly have in Santa Cruz. I uh, was noticing on the website that uh, the Latinx population, which is only 40% of California population, has 63% of the cases and 48% of the deaths. You know, so there is uh, an equity like that, which I'm sure you're aware. Absolutely. And a lot of that, you know, it's so interesting because when COVID hit, most people didn't go to work, but the, the people that went to work, the frontline workers were food, people that worked in the fields, growing the food and picking the food for us. I don't know, people think that their food comes from a grocery store or something, but it comes out of the ground and people work. And so that's why the, there's a disparity in numbers in the Latinx community, because it's a high rate of work of Latinx workers and they were out on the front lines during, at the very beginning of the pandemic when everybody was home, safely home. Um, the, Alina, Alina as, a, as a worker, as, a, as an Action Network team leader, uh, has your work uh, been uh, easier uh, to uh, provide with uh, the California legislation as it is now, uh, as opposed to maybe when it was first enacted? Uh, has, has the legislature made it any easier for you to do this great work? So the law has been improved. Um, I can talk about that now if, if it's time sure. to do that. But the law has definitely been improved. So you have to make two verbal requests within a 48 hour period and one written request. So I'm gonna say that again. So within 48 hours, you have to make two verbal requests to your physician and one written request. It used to be 15 days and people it used to be 15 days apart and people were not living long enough. They were dying before the 15 days. So it was really a good thing that this was changed to 48 hours. And then two physicians must confirm your eligibility and confirm the terminal disease. So that's going to be um, your, your attending physician and then another physician. And then two witnesses must attest to the voluntary nature of the individual's request, and only one of them can be your family. So these are kind of safeguards that nobody is pressured into using this law, because there's people that are testifying that it's voluntary and you're, and you're being um, deemed mentally competent, physically competent, and there's two doctors involved. So there's a lot of safeguards in place. So I would say, yes, the legislator, the legislature did help. I can go over those changes if you like, because I think they're important. Please, so, yes. For one of the changes is, in that, as would I. As if it was changed from 48 hours to, uh, I'm sorry, from 15 days to 48 hours. <clears throat> There used to be a form that you had to fill out 48 hours before you use the medication. That form has been removed. The amendment clarifies that medical aid in dying medication can be taken within a healthcare facility. So that's a huge clarification. And if you want to do that, you're going to have to tell your doctor so that the facility knows in advance what's happening. Uh, let's see. It clarifies that healthcare entities cannot bar providers uh, employed by them from providing health truthful, accurate information or referral when a patient has a question about medical aid and dying. So that's a huge change. Before there were systems that opted out, which they have the right to opt out, um, but they also wouldn't let their doctors talk about it. Yeah. All healthcare systems and hospices must provide their end of life option act policy on their website. This will be extremely helpful in guiding people as to where they choose to receive their health care, especially if they're very sick or terminally ill and wish to request medical aid in dying. So that's where we talked that a little bit about that before. Mm -hmm. And the bill clarifies that providers who have an objection to medical aid in dying will be required to tell the patient that they will not support them. And then the physician must document the patient's date of request and the provider's notice of their objection to the medical 
record and transfer the individual's medical record to the supporting doctor upon uh, request. So let me explain that. So for, for example, Dominican Hospital has opted out for religious reasons. So if you are a patient at Dominican and you go to your doctor and first of all, you have to qualify for the law. So let's say that you have a six month prognosis and you qualify in every other way. You go to the doctor and request support. And she says, no, she says, no, I will not support you. That now counts as your first request. Oh, okay. So this is a huge difference. Then you as a patient need to go and find a doctor in another healthcare system that will support you. And then the Dominican doctor is now obligated by law to transfer that first request to the second doctor. So that's a huge improvement in the law. Those are, those are all the changes they made. You know, um, one of the things I think that maybe is not uh, as uh, well known to folks who are um, interested in, in end of life options is the dementia that occasionally uh, accompanies end of life. Uh, are you able to give uh, some uh, some help, some support for both, you know, the, the, the loved ones and the person affected in terms of uh, a dementia that may accompany this stage of life? So, Steve, that is the number one question that we get. And every presentation we make, dementia is the number one <laughs> question that we get. So because you have to be deemed mentally competent and have a six month prognosis, by the time you get a six month prognosis in dementia, you will no longer be deemed mentally competent. Hmm. So you will not be able to use this law. However, Compassion and Choices, this wonderful organization, <laughs> has developed this whole uh, dementia toolkit for people. It's best to, as early as you can, either before you get a dementia diagnosis or still when you have in early stages when you still have cognitive function. So there's a system in place that says, you go to the website, you print out the forms and then you fill them out according to, to what you want. But basically if you, it's going to say something like, if, if I'm in late stages of dementia and I get pneumonia, I do not want my pneumonia treated because mm it's you're saying do not prolong my if i have dementia do not prolong if this is what you want some people want everything and they should have everything i'm all about choice but this will help somebody so that's an example or if i have um some other disease do not treat that disease and at some point if, if i can't feed myself or if i can't eat then i want to voluntarily stop eating and drinking so, which will end a person's life legally. So those are tools that people can use once they're in the dementia um, journey that will help. It's not gonna shorten their life, but it will not prolong their life. And that's what most people want. If I, if I have dementia, then I wanna die. So the other th thing is that there's a toolkit with questions for you to take to ask your doctor. You can fill out a, what we call a values assessment. You can say, you know, if I have dementia, if I, this, I value my life from one to 10. If I have this, this is happening to me. If this is, this is happening to me. So you can let your healthcare worker and your, and your healthcare agent know your values, what you're gonna value, what you think is important. Uh, as you end your life during dementia. So I'm really proud of Compassion and Choices for stepping up and coming up with this program for dementia because it, it's the number one question that we get when we do these presentations on the, on the law. Well, it's uh, really such wonderful work and really the name uh, Compassion and Choices uh, says it all. And I, I think that it's uh, particularly relevant, uh, Lena, as you I'm sure well know, uh, in our community, because uh, Santa Cruz County itself is, is, is graying, the population is getting older, and there are going to be more uh, um, 
times when folks are reaching uh, the end of their life that they would like to uh, uh, to to voluntarily, as the website so so wonderfully states, to, to be able to go out strong, you know, to be able to do that on your own terms, and that's the opportunities that are being provided by the support and services. I think uh, that you are able to offer through Compassion Choices. That's exactly the point. Patient-directed care and dignity at the end of your life. That's exactly what we're about. Well, Lena, we're getting to uh, so quickly now. We're getting to the end of the program. Uh, we have a couple, three, four minutes left. Uh, um, just give us your, uh, your view about uh, what you think uh, the end of life uh, dignity uh, is going to be like uh, in Santa Cruz County and, and, and in our region uh, as we move forward. Uh, are people going to have a, more of an opportunity? Or are people going to be help with services they can they can access? It's, it's such a good question, Steve. Because our largest healthcare facility, Dominican, has opted out for religious mm -hmm. reasons. So, if you are hear my voice, people, if you <laughs> are a Dominican patient, you will not have a doctor to support you at your end of life when you qualify for end of life option. Act. So, what? What can you do about that? Try to do something about that now. See if you can get into the PAMP system. Just get one doctor in the PAMP system or Kaiser. Those are the two systems that we have that support medical aid and dying. However, if you can't get into those systems, uh, PAMP's not taking new Medicare patients. So you could actually be stuck at the end. So, if you have a six month prognosis, you qualify for ho a hospice. Hospice, six month prognosis, medical aid and dying, six month prognosis, the same requirements. So if you go into hospice, when you get your prognosis, they will help you find a doctor to support you. I wanna be clear that their doctors do not write the script themselves. But if you're a hospice patient, they will help you find a doctor in this county to support you in medical aid and dying. And that's that's the best you're going to get if you're a Dominican patient. And I'll ask you this as we you know, kind of get toward the end of the program. Um, when people view this program, and of course, they're getting a lot of information, and I think it's uh, very important information uh, for people who aren't aware of options that they have, perhaps as they move through the later stages of their life. Uh, are there opportunities uh, for folks who are more interested to uh, maybe become a volunteer, to become engaged in the process a little more than just kind of viewing this program? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was going to mentioned that before we ended anyway. So if you're interested in doing this work, to call that 800 number and they will connect you to me and you'll be part of our wonderful action team that I'm oh so proud of. There's work to be done. There's legislative work to be done. If you want to volunteer in other ways, go to the website, call, call the 800 number and step up. We will welcome you with open arms. And it's a very rewarding, you know, I always say when I do volunteer work, I always get back more than I give. And that is absolutely the case. You meet wonderful people. And, you know, we are all going to have to face our mortality someday. We, nobody likes to talk about that part of it. But we're all going to do that. And this helps you understand what it's, what it's well, about. Paulina Hammer, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for uh, giving us uh, as much information as you have about Compassion Choices and your work as an Action Network uh, team leader. Mm -hmm.